Hallo. Grüß dich. Ah, guten Morgen. Wie geht's? Gut, sehr gut, ganz gut. Sehr gut. Was für ein Wetter heute. Oh. Gestern ist sehr windig. Ja. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's good to be amongst some ethnic German speakers again. It's been a while since I went a lot in my throat. My name is Ulrich Zwingli, and I am here from the country of Switzerland. It is good to be with you. I hear Erasmus was here last week, and I might have some things to say about him, although mostly good for the most part. Now, I was born on January 1st. I was a New Year's baby in the year 1484 in the village of Wildhaus in the Toggenberg Valley of Switzerland to a family of farmers. Now, I must say, one of the things about being Swiss is humbly bragging about the beauty of our country. And so, I will be showing some Swiss scenery from time to time to remind you how amazing my country is and be showing you where the places I lived. So this is the village of Wildhaus. I was a third child of nine kids and my fa father, whose name was also Ulrich, not only farmed, but he played a leading role in the administration of our village. Now, when I was young, I was taught by my uncle Bartholomew, uh, who was a cleric in the local town. That's where I went to grade school. However, at the age of 10, I was sent to the city of Basel for secondary education, and that's where I began to study Latin. <clears throat> Now, while I was studying, some Dominican monks uh, tried to convince me to join their order, and I did. But as soon as my father found out, he came all the way from my hometown, picked me up, and took me home because he did not want, it, want me joining the monks. And it was probably a good reason for that. Now, after taking a short break from my studies, I traveled to the University of Vienna, where I was a student there. Unfortunately, I was expelled from school but I am not gonna tell you what I did, okay? However, uh, two years later, the university re-accepted me. And then a couple of years later, I transferred to the University of Basel in Switzerland, where I finally received my master's degree of arts. Now, upon my graduation, I was now an ordained priest, and I took the position of the pastor at the town of Glarus. Look at how nice that is. <clears throat> Now, because everyone in town was Catholic, just like every other town in Europe, I was the pastor of the whole town. And that's way different from here, I understand. Is that right? Um, now, even though I was a priest, I had studied very little theology, which was quite normal. Most priests didn't know much theology at all, which, and there was a reason for that. Now, while I was in the village of Glarus, a number of the men in town were soldiers. Swiss soldiers in my day were considered extremely fierce and very good fighters, and they were highly sought after. And since the Swiss Confederation was kind of neutral at times, um, a lot of the Swiss soldiers were hired out as mercenaries for other people's wars. They were famous for their fighting ability and were frequently contracted by European rivals to fight their wars. So the Swiss waged many battles, especially during my time, in northern Italy. And today, in the 2000s, if you were to go to northern Italy today, the mothers of small children still threaten their kids with the boogeyman, crying, the Swiss are coming, the Swiss are coming. Now, I know that probably sounds pretty ridiculous to you because the only thing you can think of that's Swiss right now is Swiss cheese. But there was a time when we were considered very fierce. Now, it was here in Glarus that I began to get involved in politics, and I took the side of the Romans in the wars. When the soldiers went out for battle, I accompanied them as their chaplain, and I was present at a number of battles in Italy. However, at the Battle of Margiano, our Swiss mercenaries went up against a huge French army, and 10,000 of my Swiss brothers died as mercenaries. And I wrote soon after this, I wrote this, if only our sons could grow up and not be killed. Murder, murder. What has happened to the Swiss Confederacy that her sons and daughters should be sold like this? Despair, despair, wretchedness, wretchedness, sin, sin. 
O Lord, grant us peace. Now, after this, I began to speak out against all of our wars. I became one of the first people in Switzerland to start advocating for Swiss neutrality, if you've ever heard of that. However, I was no pacifist. I believed every young man should undergo military training to protect their country because I saw Switzerland as kind of like an alpine Israel, neutral, yet ready to defend the motherland at a moment's notice. Now, after my time with the soldiers, I became the pastor of another village called Einsiedeln. Doesn't that look nice? <laughs> Here, I buckled down on my studies and perfected my Greek. I would pour for hours and hours over Erasmus's Greek Bible, and I read it so long so much that I memorized the New Testament in Greek. During this time, I also took up the study of Hebrew, and I began to grow my personal library. At one point, I had 300 books of classical and patristic and scholastic works. I began to exchange scholarly letters with a, peer, with a school of Swiss humanists. I began to study the writings of Erasmus, and Erasmus became my essentially my personal mentor in those days. I even took the opportunity to meet Erasmus when he was a professor at Basel for two years. And it was because of him that I began to advocate for a more relative kind of pacifism, as well as focusing on preaching in the church. Now, in late 1518, a year after Martin Luther began his reformation, I was invited to become the people's priest at a church called Grossmünster in the city of Zurich, Switzerland. And it was a cathedral. Now I got the job because of my reputation as a fine preacher and a writer, plus my connection with Erasmus actually helped me get this job. In addition, my opposition to the French helped me get this position as well because the Zurich politicians were against the French. And so I was elected to the position in December of 1518. I was the people's priest of the entire city, which was quite large. Now on January 1st of that following year, just a month later, I gave my first sermon at this church. However, this was no ordinary event. You see, for hundreds of years, the Catholic Church had given us scriptures to preach on every Sunday canned sermons, if you will. At least that's how I saw it. And normally a pastor would preach from whatever gospel lesson there was for that day. However, on that day I did something radically different. Using Erasmus's Greek Bible, I opened it to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1, and I began to read. And I read Matthew's genealogy of Jesus. And then I gave a lengthy sermon about it, which was more interesting than you would have thought. And after I had preached through Matthew, I began preaching through Acts, and then all the epistles, and then through the entire Old Testament. Let me explain to you, this had never in the history of the church been done before. To preach through entire books had never happened. It was the first time. And it shocked the city and the people who were going, but they liked it. And as I preached, I gradually revealed my positions on the church and the Reformation. I attacked the moral corruption I saw in the church, and I actually began to name names of people who I thought needed to be called out. For example, the monks of the city, I began to accuse of their laziness and their high living, which they did. Later in that year, I rejected the veneration of saints. I called for the need to distinguish between their true and fictional accounts. I also cast doubt on hellfire, which was being used by the church to scare people into keeping it rich, because that's what they did. Now, in August of 1519, Zurich was struck by an outbreak of the plague, which one in four people died that year. Now, anyone who had money left the city during that time, but I stayed as the people's pastor. However, in September, I caught the plague, and I almost died. 
But while I was preparing for my death, I began to write a number of things, including this. I wrote, Thy purpose fulfill. Nothing can be too severe for me. I am thy vessel for you to make whole or to break to pieces. Since if you take hence my spirit from this earth, you do it so that it will not grow evil and will not mar the pious lives of others. I thought I was going to die, but I actually lived unlike a lot of people in those days. So with my new life in hand, I began to go and take this Reformation even further. Now, even though I had abandoned Catholic preaching for several years, and even though I had been advocating for Swiss um, unity, and even though I had been critical of the Catholic Church and was kind of friends with Martin Luther, the Catholic Church pretty well put up with me for a number of years. However, things started to get really dicey in 1522. And here's what happened. It was Lent. And during Lent, the church was always to abstain from eating meat for the whole six weeks. Think about that. No Burger King. Well, on the night of Sunday, March 9th, the first Sunday of Lent, I was invited to my friend's house, Christoph Froschauer, who had a printing shop and he had several men work for him. There were other people there too, men that I knew who had been advocating for reform in Switzerland. So that night, we all got together and instead of observing the meat fast, we passed around a plate filled with sausage and everybody ate the meat, consciously transgressing the rules of Lent. Now my friend Christoph said it was unfair to make working people fast from meat when they needed it for their strength. Now I will tell you, I was the only one who didn't eat the meat Okay, and that was a conscious decision by the whole group because we knew it would cause a lot of problems. Yet, a month later, I gave a sermon titled Regarding the Choice of Freedom of Foods. And in that sermon, I defended our actions because there is nowhere in the Bible that gives us food rules for Lent, and to transgress a rule like this is not a sin because it's not in Scripture. Well, this caused a huge uproar in Zurich and also around the entire Confederacy of Switzerland. And especially in the Diocese of Constance who sent this big delegation to our city and yada, 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 my city council had my back. But the whole ordeal became known as, and I'm not kidding you, the affair of the sausages. All right, look that up. And historically, this affair of the sausages is the start of the Swiss Reformation. Now, following this event, I petitioned the bishop of our area to abolish the requirement of celibacy on the clergy. Two weeks later, my petition was reprinted in German so that the whole country could read it. Now, this issue was not abstract for me because I had secretly married a widow named Anna Reinhardt earlier that year. And everyone in town knew about it and knew because we were living together. And so finally our public wedding took place on April 2, 1524, three months before the birth of our first child. You guys think you have soap operas. <clears throat> now even though the church authorities were furious, I simply wrote that they had no integrity to judge because they themselves were so obviously corrupt. That's a great excuse. <clears throat> now, I want you to understand some things about how I thought about my country, Switzerland. Now, while I was very much in favor of reforming the church, I also wanted to see my country, Switzerland, come together as a real country. At that point, we were only 13 cantons, or like 13 states, with some connections. Now, some of those cantons were very Catholic, um, a majority of them were more Protestant-leaning like myself. But I saw in my homeland, maybe there was an ability or possibility to combine the efforts of both church and state, as I said before, to become kind of like an Alpine Israel. And I wanted to see a new church established in a new Switzerland. Come on, who wouldn't want to unify a country that looks like this? Okay. 
So that is why in the reform I led to Zurich, I always proceeded very slowly and very cautiously. I wanted to go at the speed of the Swiss cantons so that we would come together. And I was willing to make concessions on my beliefs in order to see this happen. That is why I began to have trouble with a close friend of mine who was named Conrad Grabel. Now Conrad had been a close friend for a few years and he had actually had a conversion experience while studying with me. He was kind of a crazy dude, but he had a conversion and became a great supporter of my reforms. However, Conrad didn't believe that we should tie the church and state together, but instead the church should always have the freedom to be on its own. Now, while Conrad and I agreed on a number of things, including adult baptism, I was willing to keep a lot of the old laws and baptize infants because I knew it would be too hard for the government to change on this, at least for a while. But Conrad Grable believed that we should not cower to the powers when it came to scripture. And so he refused to go along with me. He wanted to start immediately. And so Grable began meeting with other like-minded men who not only refused to baptize babies, but began baptizing adults. And he and others became the leader of a movement called the Anabaptists. And of course, he and I began to butt heads very strongly. Again, I want to remind you, I was not just a Christian, but I was a Swiss patriot also. And I wanted to see my city and country come together under one Christian banner. So I could not go along with Grable and the others. It was too much too soon. So instead, I continued to focus on reforming the city at a slower pace. Now, while I didn't call for the baptism of adults, I did call attention to the church's obscene practice of ascribing unbaptized babies who had died to a place called limbo. Have you heard of limbo? In medieval theology, infants who died without benefit of baptism were consigned to limbo. Limbo was essentially thought of as an air-conditioned compartment of hell. I'm serious. There was little suffering in limbo, but neither was there hope for escape. You were there forever, unlike purgatory where you had a chance to get out. In Zurich, the custom had developed to bury unbaptized infants in the middle of the cemetery between all the profane people who were baptized and all the holy, or buried and all the holy people who were buried. Kind of like this, it was a visual image of what limbo was. Infants who were unbaptized were buried in the middle. No hope for escape. It sounded so terrible to me. And I began urging the church to give infants who had died full Christian burials because I believe it's clear in scripture that we are not saved by the waters of baptism, but we are saved by Christ's sacrifice on a cross. I also called for the removal of statues of saints and other icons in the church where I was. And I also argued against the mass. And I taught that it was always supposed to be a commemorative meal. I wanted to begin celebrating mass differently, but it was still a full two years before the city council decided to go along with me. But finally, on Monday, Thursday of 1525, I celebrated communion under a brand new liturgy. And instead of doing regular mass that Sunday, or that Thursday, instead we set up these big tables in the cathedral and we bought wooden cups and wooden plates. And we ate as though we were having a meal. Now, at the service, there was to be no singing, just a sermon and a meal. And during this meal, I proposed that instead of having mass every Sunday, we would have communion four times a year only. Now, back to politics. <clears throat> On April 8th of 1524, the five Swiss cantons who were on the Catholic side of the Reformation formed an alliance and they came out to fight the rest of Switzerland because they wanted to defend their cantons from my Reformation. Now I thought by now the Swiss would be unified under my Reformation but it didn't happen. 
And so the first Kappel War began. And even though we raised a much larger army than they did, and we basically convinced these rogue cantons to back down without too much fighting, they still were not willing to join our Reformation. And I lost a lot of political clout during that time. So after this war, I continued my work and began arguing with a certain Martin Luther about the reform movement. Now, Luther and I famously disagreed on the interpretation of the Eucharist, which is like communion, which was a big deal. And I do not want to bore you with the details because they are long. But anyway, in the end, an effort was made to bring our two sides together because we agreed on a lot of things. So in 1528, both sides of the Protestant Reformation uh, met in Marburg, Germany to discuss our differences and agreements. And this became known as the Marburg Colloquy. And the debates were held over three days in October. And at the end, we were able to come up with 15 Marburg articles. However, we can only agree on 14 of them. The 15th, of course, being about the Eucharist. And so instead of uniting our two reforms, Martin Luther's and mine, under one name, from that day on, Lutherans went their way and our Reformed Church went the other. We were that close to getting together back then. So, some final things about my life. <clears throat> On October 9th, 1531, in a surprise move, those five Catholic cantons I mentioned, they declared war on Zurich. Now, Zurich's mobilization was slow due to a bunch of internal squabbling in our city. And so, when our city went out to meet them in battle, we had 3,500 men who were poorly trained and poorly equipped. However, in that army, number of reformed Swiss pastors, including myself, I was wielding a double-headed axe. I went out to fight with them. The battle lasted, lasted less than one hour. They had twice as many guys. And there were 500 men who died on our side, including myself. Now, of the many things I have stood for in my life, communion, baptism, scripture teaching, politics, social issues. I'd like to leave you with this. In 1 Peter it says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. In my day, a gathering like the one we have right now would have carried no authority. We would have been considered unintelligent and naive and we would have had no knowledge of what scriptural interpretation was about. Only the bishops and the cardinals and the pope could make decisions about our community for us. Because they thought they knew better. But here is the thing. You are good enough. You do have the authority to teach each other the scriptures. You do have the understanding you need from the Spirit to be God's people. We are the community, the body of Christ. And as long as you read and study the scriptures, as long as you practice true communion, and as long as you listen to the Spirit together, you are who Jesus says you are, a royal priesthood able to be Christ to the world. So may you know and remember who you are today and remember that as we pray together. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that we can worship today in freedom, that we might worship today as a body who has the authority to make the decisions we can make in our local place. Continue to guide this church as they come together to make decisions to pray, and to listen to your spirit in all ways as they continue to be your light to this town and this country. We pray in your name. Amen.